Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, a place to find connection and a sense of belonging, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we talk about sensitivity and the richness that it adds, the strengths we have because of our sensitivity, and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers. I was so excited about this interview with Dr. Tracy Cooper, who wrote a book called Thrill, and he has studied high sensation seeking. This is like drinking from a fire hose. I have five pages of notes. I'm just in the process of writing them all up, but I want to tell you what you can expect in this episode. We talk about what is high sensation seeking and what does that look like as an HSP? And I think people think of high sensation seeking only in terms of skydiving or riding motorcycles or racing. But as you'll find out in this episode, it shows up in so many ways that really are relevant to the HSP. We talk about how many highly sensitive people are high sensation seekers, are more introverts or extroverts high sensation seekers. Dr. Cooper talks about the four categories that high sensation seeking shows up in. We talk about the correlation between ADHD and high sensation seeking. He talks about dopamine and procrastination. Sometimes it's high sensation seekers that can impact our levels of sensitivity, empathy, and being more impatient. We talk about entropy, depression, anxiety. What I love is he talks about being in a flow state and that HSPs are wired for creativity, which just excited me to no end. He also talks about boundaries in the HSP and what we can do when we're overactivated. And we also talk about social media, electronics, and boredom and how that impacts the HSP. I think you're going to love this episode. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Cooper. Tracy Cooper, PhD, is an expert in the areas of highly sensitive people and career, the high sensation seeking highly sensitive person, the highly sensitive man, and highly sensitive people in creativity. He's written two books, Thrive, The Highly Sensitive Person in Career, and Thrill, The High Sensation Seeking Highly Sensitive Person. His forthcoming book is titled Empowering the Sensitive Male Soul. Dr. Cooper appeared in the 2015 documentary film, Sensitive, the Untold Story. He is the department chairman for Baker University's Master of Liberal Arts program and a faculty member. Dr. Cooper regularly works with individuals in career crisis and transition, as well as corporations interested in diversity and inclusion initiatives for HSPs, innovation, and high sensation seeking HSPs and frequently speaks on subjects related to sensory processing, sensitivity, and sensation seeking. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can really help me out by going to your podcast app or going to the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com. Go to the podcast page and click on this episode, and there are links in it that show you how to write a review in iTunes. It really helps to validate the podcast and to help other people find it. And now onto the show. Hey, Tracy, welcome. Thank you. I am so excited to to have this conversation with you. We talked about this before we started recording that when I get really excited, I get tasky and I get really distracted. I might get a little over aroused, but I can't wait to have this conversation with you. Let's just jump right in and you talk about what does it look like if a highly sensitive person is a high sensation seeker? Yeah, so high sensation seeking is a separate trait that was originated by a psychologist named Marvin Zuckerman in the late 1960s. And they would put people in isolation tanks. They were doing sensory deprivation experiments at the time. And they realized that some people, as soon as they got in these tanks, they really wanted back out. (laughs) They really didn't like being isolated. And so they did some further testing where they would put people in a room and then they would see how they reacted. And the people inevitably that were high sensation seekers really wanted out no matter what they did. And so they started looking at sensation seeking as a separate trade and started identifying the core aspects of it. And so there's four key aspects to it, kind of like with sensitivity has four key aspects. There's four key aspects to sensation seeking. So the first is the one that most people are the most familiar with, thrill and adventure seeking. 
So this would be physical thrills such as bungee jumping, jumping out of airplanes, parachuting, anything that gives a physical sort of rush or a sensation of adrenaline. Your adrenaline junkies would be very much thrilling adventure seekers. Most HSPs would not identify in that way, though some have. I've spoken with some that do identify that way. The second one would be novelty and new experience seeking. And this is the one that really crosses over for highly sensitive people. So the idea of traveling to new places, uh, having new experiences just for the sake of having the experience is novelty and new experience seeking. And a lot of us tend to be high in that, even if we're highly sensitive people, which seems quite dichotomous, but it actually works out quite well. The third one is boredom susceptibility. So having a problem with boring conditions where you're feeling anxious, where you're feeling depressed, or you're just feeling bored. Boredom is an effective state, and it's something that could be a low mood. It could be feeling aversive. It could be feeling like you really want something to happen. You really want some stimulation. But it can also, for the sensation seeker, can really almost be physically painful to be in this boredom state. And so they'll do almost anything to avoid it. A lot of people that are sensation seekers tend to describe boredom as their worst enemy, their number one enemy that they try to stay ahead of. It's not that they're not doing enough, it's that they have a capacity that has to be engaged and capacity is big to be engaged. And the fourth one is disinhibition. So the opposite of being inhibited, which a lot of sensitive people are, disinhibition would be just the opposite of that. So doing something strictly for the sake of doing it and not caring about the rules, not caring whether there's legal repercussions, financial repercussions, personal repercussions. This can be a problem also because you can get in trouble doing some of these things. So this inhibition as one of the permissions that sensation seekers give themselves to do something that might seem a little bit crazy, like jumping out of an airplane, for instance, this inhibition feeds the other ones, I believe. So those are your four key aspects of sensation seeking. And what I heard you say is that novelty and new experiences where you tend to see HSPs, is it fair to make an assumption or have, is there research about which one of these HSPs tend to fall in more often than not? They tend to, in my experience, I'm a, I'm a researcher and all of the people that I've interviewed, and I interviewed 35 people for my book, Thrill, The High Sensation Seeking Highly Sensitive Person, they tended to cross over on boredom susceptibility and novelty and new experience seeking. And then they tended to not cross over as much on disinhibition or thrill and adventure seeking. So when you think about sensitivity as being something where you deeply process experience. You, you process it in a more elaborate way inside of our minds where we're sensitive to subtleties. New experiences are wonderful in that regard. There's no point in having sensitivity to subtleties if you're not experiencing new things. So they kind of go hand in hand in a way, and they do tend to cross over quite a bit between people who are HSPs and people who are high sensation seeking HSPs. I was wondering too, with the novelty and new experiences, could that be like someone who only likes to read a book once or only see a movie once because they like the novelty where there are other people that have a favorite movie and they've seen it over and over and over? Yeah, absolutely. You know, people that are higher in sensation seeking and we're all sensation seeking to one extent or another, it's more of a continuum. So everyone, all humans are sensation seeking to some degree, just like all people are sensitive to some degree. It's just a matter of where you're at along that. So if you tend to be higher in sensation seeking, the idea of reading a book a second time may just be intolerable. That's, that may, be, may propel the boredom aspect for you, and you don't want to read it again. You'd rather do something new than, than tread the same ground again. The same with movies and that kind of thing. Maybe you don't want to see it again. I personally have that problem myself. I cannot watch a show two, two times. I can't watch a movie two times, unless it's really exceptional. And then that's where I think the sensitivity to subtleties come in, where I want to pick out key details I didn't notice the first time. But in general, it's not wanting to do the same thing twice, that novelty and new, it can be a powerful drive to push you forward in life, but also it can be kind of a problem because you're always seeking these new experiences in our world. Is it, it a day-to-day -day world? And it doesn't always have these wonderful novel experiences. So you're always in search of that, always sort of a self-perpetuating treadmill that you're on seeking new experiences. Sure. I want to lay a little bit of the foundation. Now, of the people that are highly sensitive, what are the percentage of those folks that are high sensation seekers? Right. So the percentage of highly sensitive people that are also high sensation seeking is, is estimated to be around 30%. So about one third of HSVs are also high in sensation seeking. Okay. And then is there any division between the highly sensitive people that are introverts and extroverts where high sensation seeking shows up? It, you know, it's presumed that a lot of times because a sensation seeker acts more extroverted, I mean, when they're out in public and they're seeking novelty and they're seeking new experience, it makes them seem more extroverted. But I don't think that's the case at all. I think the numbers pretty well hold the same. 
I think that about 30% are maybe extroverted and about 70% are probably introverted. And that might seem quite kind of the opposite of what you would imagine, but you know, there's a plasticity to being a sensitive person. There's a plasticity to human beings in our brains, neuroplasticity. So we can act out of type, you know, quite often. And I think that is the case with people who are high sensation seeking HSPs, we tend to act out of type because we want the adrenaline rush of the new experience, the little hit of dopamine that we get in our brain. And that's how sensation seeking works is through that pleasure pathway in the brain, the dopamine uptake pathway. So every time we have a new experience that's novel, we get that little bit of hit of dopamine and that makes us want to do more of it. And I just want to make sure that I got the, I'm taking notes at the same time. Uh, so the 30, 70, so of those high sensation seekers that are highly sensitive, 30% are extroverted and 70% are introverted talking about high sensation seeking. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's presumed to be the numbers, but some people will presume that because someone is acting as a sensation seeker, they seem to be on the exterior to be more extroverted. That's not necessarily true. Myself, I'm, a, I'm more of an introverted, high sensation seeking HSP. So I can, attest, I can attest that it's a reality. And a lot of the people that I've interviewed have been the same way. They've been quite profound HSPs. And so the, and we know the vast majority of them are introverted as well. Okay. And now if we're looking at high sensation seekers that are non-HSPs, what's the percentage that shows up in the general population? Um, well, as I described, sensation seeking is thought of to be more of a general trait in the human species. So it, everybody is sensation seeking to some degree. And when it comes to any of these personality traits, and there's a lot of personality traits, an extreme expression of a trait is never a good thing. It's never a good thing, particularly with sensation seeking, because at the high end of things, if you're taking really crazy risk to have those adrenaline rushes, those little hits of dopamine, you can get into a lot of trouble and you can maybe even not live to reproduce. So an extreme expression of a trait is not necessarily a good thing. A more moderate expression is a healthy thing for the species because then we can take advantage of really the giftedness of the trait, whatever that trait really has. And there's some really powerful things within sensation seeking that are, are wonderful things to have wonderful attributes, but it's generally shaped like a, like a bell shaped curve. So in the middle of it would be the high point and then it would kind of drift off toward the, the extreme end on both sides. So it's sort of a bell shape with more people in the vast middle of it that are the majority of it and fewer at the far extreme end. And probably the same with sensitive people as well. There's fewer people at the extreme, extreme end of sensitivity because then that would make you pretty well non-functional to some degree. But if you back it off a little bit, you're still within the sort of highly sensitive part. It's the same with sensation seeking. You can be a moderate high expression and have that be very workable in daily life. Great. And can we just talk a little bit about, I, I understand the four categories that high sensation seeking shows up, but can we maybe add some stories about what this might look like in people? We've laid a little bit of a foundation, but I really want people to get, what would this look like if I have it? Yeah. So if you're, if you are a thrill and adventure seeker, you're someone that really enjoys the physical thrills. You, you like maybe driving cars fast and in a daily life that might be Maybe you speed a little bit to give you that little bit of a rush. You know, maybe you go just a little faster than everybody else. Or, or maybe you take a little chance on doing something when you're driving. Or maybe you watch a TV show that's a little more exciting than other people might watch. Now, that seems the opposite of what a sensitive person would do. But then again, like I said, we have to be very mindful of plasticity. Those of us that are high sensation seeking and highly sensitive, we tend to bounce back and forth trying to balance the two. And it's quite a delicate balance at times. But a lot of times the sensation seeker side tends to outbalance the sensitive side. And that can be a problem because you can burn out. But if you are someone that is a novelty and new experience seeker, which probably a lot of people who are HSPs who also identify as sensation seekers probably lie, probably identify with, you will maybe travel to new things. You will seek out new experiences. Maybe you'll see an art event. You go to a, an especially interesting movie that's come out just to see the production values or to see something new about it. Maybe you'll try different foods. You'll try interesting new books. You'll try just about anything in order to get that novelty. And that sense of novelty can be really profound as well because you go to quite great lengths to get it. And it can only almost be a drive. So in that sense in daily life, you could be someone that really isn't satisfied with ordinary things. You can be someone that really has to go from, for instance, in work, maybe you're not satisfied with the job that's very repetitive, but you have to really be in a job or a career that really moves you from thing to thing. So you have that sense of novelty. A lot of people that are high end sensation seeking that are HSPs tend to not like to do one thing. They tend to be best suited to short-term projects just for the sake of that novelty. With boredom susceptibility, 
in daily life, you tend to not like things that really reach a point of boredom. And we get into talking about the flow experience almost with this, because on either side of the flow channel are anxiety and boredom on the other side. So when you're not challenged enough, you find out that you're in a boredom state where you're feeling it's an aversive state where you're feeling negative, where you're feeling like, oh, I don't have any energy. I don't want to do anything or this activity is boring. I really don't want to do it. Of course, we have to do things as a matter of daily life to get them done. But the preference is to stay within our optimal state of arousal. So within that, we have to have a snuff stimulation to stay somewhere in that range of optimal arousal. And boredom susceptibility is a powerful, powerful motivator for high sensation seeking HSPs because it's a drive that will push you to seek out that night. Like I said, those two, the disinhibition and the boredom susceptibility will push you to get the novelty and new experience. That's the way the trait works itself. The last one being disinhibition is sort of throwing caution to the wind. So you may be somebody that that jumps the stop sign, somebody that goes a little bit before the light turns red, you know, you go on through it. You could be someone that maybe you go to parties, you know, maybe you have varied sexual partners, maybe you kind of do some wild things in life, you know, maybe you uh, have experimented with different types of drugs to have different types of experience, or maybe you do things that really kind of take you out of ordinary reality. Disinhibition is a powerful driver for the other parts of the trait. So those four combined, I mean, there's numerous examples in each one of these, but probably the most salient being the novelty and new experience seeking and the boredom susceptibility. So thinking about those in daily life, you can really see how maybe they come out in your own life and how they express. Let me ask you this. So what I, I'm, I'm, I'm having this fear. It's like, I think I'm a high sensation seeker and my fears are going to go, nope, that doesn't count. You're not it. And it's like, I'm not in the club anymore. So, <laughs> so that's what's going on with my thinking. Where I think my high sensation seeking comes up is my vulnerability. Like I love intense interactions. I feel like I'm the poster child for vulnerability. I don't, I, I'm mindful about how I do it, but that intense connection that I can get when I have really open, vulnerable conversations is like, it almost puts me in a flow state. What do you think about that? Oh, that's right. Can I stay in the club? <laughs> I think you can. Okay. So, you know, Dr. Elaine Aaron has said that what's more stimulating than other people, right? We seek stimulation through other people. And if you think about sensitivity, for example, it really is focused on other people. You know, it's focused somewhat on the external environment, but it really is focused on people. You know, we absorb energy from other people being high in empathy and we process that stimulation more elaborately. So when you're talking about sensation seeking, what gives us more stimulation than other humans, other people, other social interactions? It doesn't make us an extrovert. It means we derive some sort of pleasure from that. We get that little dopamine hit from an intense conversation or a deep conversation. There is a vulnerability within that. But yes, it very much can be expressed as seeking sensation through other people. Okay. I like that. I'm glad I, I can stay in the club. What is the relationship between procrastination, like waiting to the last minute and then getting that thrill? Do you get a dopamine hit if you're rushing to finish a project or a paper or something like that? Is there, does that fit into this? Procrastination and sensation seeking. I think they, you could be someone who seeks the stimulation, but you can be someone also that puts it off because you don't know that it's really going to be stimulating enough. And it's a strange thing sometimes. It, novelty, sometimes you'll you'll not want to do the experience for whatever reason, but it may be the best thing for you in the end. I think it's an interplay between the two, actually, between sensitivity and sensation seeking, because sensitivity is more of an inhibited sort of a trait. It's more of a more of a quiet trait. So it may pull you back and say, no, we don't want to go have this experience. But the sensation seeker says, yes, I want to have the experience. Sometimes I think the procrastination, particularly for people who are HSPs as well, tends to be from the sensitive side that just doesn't want to engage, doesn't want to take on the energy. So that's the procrastinating element in this. But the sensation seeker will derive all the benefit from it if you actually go through it. That's really interesting. We were just talking about this. I run some online HSP courses and we were talking about, and so I'd love to have you put this in your words. What we were talking about is that difficulty with transitions of there's an event coming up. It sounded fun in the moment. Now that I'm engaged in something, I don't really want to make the shift from this activity to that activity. And often we think that self-care means not engaging and having time to recover when oftentimes, at least for those of us that were talking about it, when we're able to push and do it, 
more often than not, we really enjoy the activity, but that transition of getting from here to there can feel insurmountable. Does this fit into what we're talking about or is this something entirely different? No, it's really the same thing. They're really the, the two sides of the same coin and that a lot of sensitive people are reticent to go try new things because they prefer to pause to check it out, you know, pause to think before they take an action. Sometimes pausing too long. <laughs> if you always have the brakes on, you never get anywhere. So a lot of sensitive people really do need to push themselves a little bit to do more things because you only live once in this life and there's a lot of wonderful things to experience and you don't get those when you're hiding away in your house all the time and you do need to come out of your comfort zone in order to grow. You can't grow if you're always doing the same familiar things constantly, but within reason. I mean, you push yourself in, in ways that you're comfortable, but sometimes in ways that you're uncomfortable as well because that can lead to the greatest growth opportunities. Whereas if you don't, you'll never know how you could have grown or what you could have enjoyed. So there's a, you know, disinhibition serves a real point in that when you think about it, because it's that, that motivating factor that says, we're going to do this anyway. And so it beats the procrastination, that disinhibition will beat that procrastination and allow you to have that new experience. And sometimes it's a godsend because you never would have done it otherwise if you had not been high in cessation seeking and had that other element. Sometimes I think highly sensitive people don't necessarily have that and they need a little bit of a push from other people to bring them along to come out and do something that they might not do otherwise, but they have a wonderful time if they do it. Right. And for me, because I thought I was an introvert before I knew about being a highly sensitive person. And then when I found out about being a highly sensitive person, I still thought I was an introvert. I think so much of what we read about introverts is really about the HSP and talking about all the downtime that we need. And while we do need that, I don't think that we talk enough about it's like every day brushing my teeth and taking a shower. I may not always want to do it, but I know it's really good for me, so I do it. But I don't think that we have that same model for pushing ourselves to do things. And my guess is that many of us have done things and have gotten so overstimulated and so over aroused that we don't want to go back into those situations. But then we get stuck in this loop of feeling listless because we need to find that sweet spot. Is that something you've experienced? And can you talk about how do we push through that and how do we find that balance? Yeah, there's a thing called analysis paralysis, where you have an experience and maybe it's a negative experience or an experience that you, you didn't really like. And then you decide, I'm not going to ever do that again. And then so if an opportunity comes up again that's similar to that, you 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 will he and haw and get to a point to where you absolutely won't break through it, you know, because you get into a pattern of doing that. And if you do that for, for a long time, you can really become stuck and in a rut. So learning to break through that is really the key. And I think you have to cultivate a certain sense of mindfulness about it since that whatever happened in the moment is now past because the next moment is never the same as the last moment. And we can only experience each moment one at a time going forward. That's the sense of time itself is each moment is entirely unique and no one moment resembles the last moment because it can't like no two drops of water are the same in a river. It's flowing. It looks the same, but each, each drop of water is entirely different and it will never be the same again. So looking at that, as far as being in a rut and being able to break out of it, I think there's a, a sense of wonder and curiosity that we should cultivate, that we should think about the fact that we have limited time in this life and that we can choose to not do things and we can choose to do things, or we can choose to find a balance between the two of taking care of ourselves, but also pushing ourselves to do the things that we need to do or that we, we, will, we will grow from, especially not necessarily the things that we have to do, but the things that we would like to do. And I think what I've experienced with highly sensitive people is we tend to be curious people. We tend to be people that are, for the most part, positive minded and people that are enthusiastic when you get them going. When they're interested in something, I think they're unstoppable. Yeah, um, I'm just taking just taking notes copiously. The two things that I found are reminding people that we're not young again, where we get that place where we feel stuck. It's like, try it. And if it's too much, you get to leave. So remembering that we're not these little people that are, that are stuck in these bodies that can't get out of an experience system so sometimes, you know, go and, and try it out and see how it is. And sometimes with the newness, things can feel really scary. So for those of us that work well with connection, I think having a buddy go to something new with somebody or find out who's going to be there that you connect with, if that's an approach that helps you try new things, because it's so easy to get stuck in that place of wanting to do something, but the fear of the unknown can, for some of us, can be too much. Right. The fear of the unknown can be paralyzing. The idea that you maybe want to go do something, but you don't know what to expect. And anxiety can be a terrible problem for 
highly sensitive people and that we, we want to know what to expect, but we also kind of like the unknown to a certain extent. It's the whole point of the trade itself, which is pause to check or pause to think before we do something. But we can pause too long and then miss the opportunity altogether. So it's the accepting that anxiety is fine because it, what anxiety does simply ask you to think about what it is you're contemplating. So you don't put yourself in danger in some way or put other people in danger or cause yourself a problem in some way. So if you can, if you can negotiate that and understand that, you know, moving forward, there's always going to be some anxiety and that your anxiety will likely dissipate once you're doing the event, then you can learn how to break through. But it also helps a lot, a lot to have someone to go with you or to have someone that you're going to, to meet at the party or somebody that you already know at the event so that you'll feel much more comfortable. And that can be the, really the difference between making comfortable and not is knowing at least one person. And you don't have to know them intimately, just a casual friendship or something like that can really, really help. Yeah, I know for me that that's how I'm wired. If there's a party, I, I don't care what you're doing. I just want to know who's going to be there because if I can connect with somebody, then that gives me a sense of like, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a good time then. Yeah. Right. What is the connection or the correlation between ADHD and high sensation seeking? Is there one? There seems to be, there's a lot of ongoing research around sensation seeking and ADHD. And they seem to share some components in common, but there are some differences as well. Sensation seekers, depending on how high, how high you are on the trait, it kind of works in a different way to some extent than does ADHD. ADHD tends to be a state where your, your brain is not able to get the stimulation that it thinks it needs. And so it will seek stimulation. And when it finds a little bit of stimulation, more is always better, it thinks. So it's going to seek more and more and more stimulation. And it'll rise to a point where it's so extreme that the person then falls apart, can't function because they can't focus anymore. Or it can be the opposite of that, where the person isolates themselves too much and they focus on something like, say, a video game. And they'll play that intensely simply because that's the way they're getting their stimulation. But it can be overindulgence and an inability to focus that becomes a real problem with ADHD, obviously. But with sensation seeking, a person can focus on the stimulation that they're trying to get, whether it's novelty and new experiences or thrill and adventure seeking. Um, and those are propelled, again, by the boredom susceptibility and the disinhibition. But once a person has that experience, they don't necessarily lose the ability to focus. You know, they're, they're still able to focus on what they're doing when they're having a, a new experience or they're seeking novelty, whereas ADHD tends to be more of an issue with the ability to focus on what they're doing at the time or the ability to focus on cognitive tasks. I don't think that sensation seekers necessarily have a problem with focusing on a cognitive task so much as it is they're simply seeking the sensation. Okay. Since you started it, <laughs> I want to jump to a question I was going to ask you later. What is the impact of social media, electronics, video games on boredom and our need for stimulation? I, I think you just addressed this, but I'd love to address it a little bit more directly. Right. So social media, definitely. I, I'm a child of the 70s. So I grew up, you know, po or pre computers, pre cell phones and pre video games. Near, we had the we had Pong, you know, as the first video game. I'm sort of that generation that came of age before we had any of this tech for the most part. So. I've become comfortable with it as time has moved along and now it's second nature, but now it's become so second nature that you almost can't distinguish between a time when it didn't exist. So, and you see children today that are constantly focused on their smartphones. It's become like an addiction where they, they lo almost lose the social skills, the way to interact. And so if you're a sensation seeking, highly sensitive person, seeking that stimulation through other people is it, always going to be your best bet. But when you're seeking it online or when you're seeking it through smartphones and that kind of thing, then it can become a real problem because you're, you generally, you will gravitate to people that are like you. So whatever your particular views, whatever culture you come from, your norms, values, and beliefs, you'll seek out things that confirm what you already believe and you'll ignore things that are contrary to that. That's called confirmation bias. So social media can be a, a real challenge in ferreting out what's really of worth to you as a human being and what is not, what is simply a distraction. But no doubt, uh, social media and technology offers us great advantages in being able to have the, you know, the information of the world at our fingertips. We could literally look up anything we want to look up. At, where in the past, like in 1970s, for instance, I would have to go to the library and spend time trying to find a book, a relative book with the good information in it. Or microfiche. Microfiche, yeah. <laughs> If you haven't heard it, Google it. <laughs> yeah. And today it's just a matter of 
typing it literally into Google and pursuing a couple of websites to find relevant information. Sometimes even PDFs are available to download instantly and bang, you've got everything you need. Or if you need to learn a process like how to cook something, you can look it up on YouTube and it's, there's people there that have already done it. So it's wonderful in that way, but it's so enticing that it can become an addiction. And really it, that isn't what really feeds human beings. Human beings are really fed by being around each other to some extent and by being outside and having sunshine and fresh air and moving. The idea of movement is very important. And that's one of the issues with social media is people spend so long really just sitting and not moving. So there's no air moving to their brain the way it should. Their blood isn't pumping well. It's, you know, it's sedentary. It creates too much sedentary lifestyle. And that's a real problem for not only for adults, but especially for children who need to be active and moving and doing things and trying things and allow the chance to fail at things. When you're consuming social media, you're only, you're only getting something that's already been written and been polished and been edited. You're not really getting people that are showing vulnerabilities. Like I tried this and I failed at, and this is what I learned. You're getting things that have already been worked out for the most part. Right. And I think one of the things, and I really have a love hate relationship with electronics and my phone, because on one hand, when I get overstimulated, it's kind of nice to play a game or to fall into something, but it really in the long term doesn't really soothe me, but it's something that's easy to do. And for many of us that have wounding where we have that, that belief of being too much or too needy, that it's safer to retreat into social media or electronics as opposed to risking reaching out to another person and having them not be available. I'm, I'm not saying this is true for all HSPs. I'm, I'm owning this as part of my wounding, but I can't tell you how many people I talk to that struggle with this. And so I think that social media can be great and it can also be a really slippery slope. And I can attest to that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it can become a crutch. Uh, sort of an emotional crush that we reach for uh, as a way of self-soothing in a way, but it's kind of mindless self-soothing because we don't actually learn how to, how to control our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. We simply tune out by checking out the latest things on Facebook or the problem with that, of course, so many people are posting on things like Facebook groups that have all kinds of personal problems that really can't be dealt with by other people. And so many people are trying to help them, but that's really the wrong venue for that. I mean, people really need to, to, dig into these issues with people who are skilled and qualified to be able to help them to some real positive effect. Uh, and social media, a lot of times is sensationalism or it's propaganda at its worst. And it doesn't tend to, to feed the person's spirit. It doesn't tend to do anything for them other than be a crutch, which is simply a distraction. I mean, in the older days, people would simply watch television <laughs> to distract themselves. And that would be hours and hours and hours. Even, you know, older people still do that. They don't, they don't do technology so much. But they'll still watch TV shows for many hours on a day simply to distract themselves, to fill up time or to avoid doing things. But it can be there is a delicate balance and it can be very helpful because uh, if you're traveling, for instance, in an airport, it can be wonderful to watch a short thing, a short video or to listen to some music via some earbuds in your, your cell phone. And, and uh, things like Kindle, where you can watch a movie in a flight, you can pick the movie you want to watch. It maybe is good for you uh, and help, help, help pass the time. But too much of anything could be a real problem. And technology is so seductively, so seductively addictive that we don't even realize it sometimes. And there could be real addictions to tech. Yep. Yep. And it's not the behavior. It, it's not that food, sex, games, TV, videos, shopping, any of those things are inherently good or bad. They can be adaptive or maladaptive depending on what's going on. And there are times when we're going through really hard times and it can be really nurturing to hold up and watch Netflix for the day because we need something soothing. So for those people that hear this and take it as a rule that whatever you're doing is bad or wrong, we're really just talking about being mindful about how we're using things. And I will own, I use my phone too much. I know it's too much. I'm not in a place right now where I'm willing to do it less, but what I am willing to do is to talk about it's not working for me. So we can use mindfulness and self-compassion when we recognize that we're doing things that maybe aren't working and we're not in a place where we're going to change it, but we can just go, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Yay. Right. And, you know, we, we, we do have to practice some certain amount of self-compassion because self-compassion really is self-love at the end. It's looking at ourselves objectively and befriending ourselves and saying, hey, you know, it's fine that you're doing this at this moment. And maybe at some point in the future, you'll transition to doing something else. But, you know, tech in and of itself can be can be innocuous enough. Like I said, it could be a, a wonderful way to self-soothe or to help you to get through things. But when taken to an extreme, it can be a real issue. Right. 
I've been listening to your book, Thrive on Audible, and I heard you talk about highly sensitive person versus the high sensation seeker and high sensation seekers, I, I may get this wrong, so please correct me, can be less sensitive, less empathic, and more impatient. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sensation seeking, highly sensitive people, yeah, they definitely can be, they definitely can allow the sensation seeking side to win out over the sensitive side and overrule it in a lot of cases. Sometimes just to have the experience, whatever it is, and we, we take the sensitive person along for the ride, <laughs> knowing that they're not going to enjoy it. Um, I just did it last night, actually going to a concert <laughs> and I was completely in sensation seeking mode. And, but I was exhausted also when I came home and just totally fell asleep. But it was a wonderful experience. And sometimes you need to do that as a sensation seeker. You need to let the sensation seeking side out to run. But the problem with that is in your haste to seek sensation, you don't necessarily want to become less empathetic. You don't want to become less compassionate to other people. You don't want to lose yourself, the best parts of yourself, in seeking sensation. So the trick is always in balancing out the two because sensation seeking is a very strong trait. Maybe it's stronger in some ways uh, as a motivating factor than sensitivity. Sensitivity is something that you can retreat to and something at your core personality but sometimes sensation seeking can be more seductive and more, it can win out more easily over you because it's more fun to go seek some kind of sensation through novelty, new experiences, even sometimes through thrill seeking to some extent. So learning to balance the two can moderate this idea that um, you become less empathetic, you become less patient, the kind of those negative qualities that can go with it. And it does have a dark side. Sensation seeking does have a dark side. I mean, you can become addicted. You know, you can take financial risks that will cause you to lose a lot of money, like gambling, for instance. You can take legal risks like speeding. If you get caught, you're going to get a ticket. Uh, you could even get hurt. You can hurt other people in seeking sensation if you're driving very fast or if you're doing other things. There are risks entailed in that. And most sensation seekers, they know they understand the risk, but they're willing to take the risk in order to have the sensation, in order to have the dopamine rush. So almost you can almost correlate to two. When you're kind of blocking things out, you become less empathetic, you become less compassionate, you become less patient. So learning to rein that in a little bit and decide when you want to let that sensation seeker out to run is really the key to holding it down to a certain extent. And sensitivity tends to do that. It tends to be an effective counterbalance if you're self-aware. If you're not self-aware, you don't really know what's going on. But the more self-aware you become about sensitivity, and sensation seeking, the more you can see that it counterbalances because it's the pause to check. So when you're feeling like you really want to go out and do something, you weigh it before you do it. You, you kind of check in with your sensitive self to say, hey, is this something that's smart? <laughs> is this something that I want to do? Is it worthwhile doing? Is it going to hurt other people? You can weigh it in the interest of fairness. What is the relationship between, because I think that it's it's not uncommon for people that are highly sensitive that maybe don't always have the tools to self-regulate when we get over aroused, over stimulated. Maybe we didn't get it in childhood. So we often use substances, food, drinking, movies, shopping, all of those things as a way to numb. Is that different than what I just heard you talk about with addictions and and kind of how we lose some of our sensibility? Are we talking about two different animals here? No, I think you can self-soothe and be perfectly healthy. I mean, uh, going and doing something like shopping or, or going to do something that's pleasant for you is a totally different thing than going and doing something that will lead to an addiction, like taking undue risk. It's when you're taking undue risk is when it becomes a problem. But a sensitive person that needs to have a little bit of stimulation to go do something different can be very effective at self-care. It can be very contributory to self-care because a lot of times we do need to change our surroundings. We do need to go somewhere. We need to get out of our environment, whatever we're in. We need to visit with some people or see some new people or whatever the case. Those things aren't addictive at all. They're not really a problem. Those are very effective ways to reduce our stress and learn how to self-regulate. Sometimes post-processing with another person, an event that's happened really is the best thing we can do to get us out of our head and allow someone to provide us with objectivity. And it doesn't necessarily lead to any kind of a problem. It's simply an effective coping strategy. But learning to develop the self-care practices is really key for sensitive people. And it's also key for sensation seeking sensitive people because we, we really have to understand uh, that we can get into, we can get into a bad place with sensation seeking. So if we understand that going into it, admitting that we're all most, most of us are not children, that we're all adults at some stage or another, that we have to kind of recalibrate. We have to reframe how we think about 
how we live our lives. So we understand this is sensation seeking, this is high sensitivity, and this is how the two mesh and interact. And this is how I, I provide self-care so that I can continue in a really sustainable and productive way. Okay. Thank you. There's so much information to process. And so I'm, I'm just absorbing a lot. And yeah, I, there's just a lot of information. Can you talk a little bit about entropy and depression? And then is anxiety a part of that relationship? Yeah. The originator of flow, Chik Sintmihai, he talks about entropy as a natural state for human beings, that we, we naturally enter this state of entropy and we get into this boredom state when we're not in a flow state. And a flow state really is defined as engaging your capacities in such a way that is challenging, taking on a challenging task, but not overly challenged. In other words, your skills are matched to the task where you kind of lose track of time and you become totally absorbed in the moment and where you get immediate feedback from the task. So it's a challenging task that you do. And a flow activity can really be anything. It doesn't have to be some huge project. It can be washing the dishes, for instance, can be quite challenging. And doing it in the right way that you're actually being very mindful in the moment. So it's being absorbed in that moment. So when you're in that state, you lose track of anxiety and you're definitely not bored. So that's what's on either side of the channel. If you think of flow as a channel, as like a river, on one side is boredom and the other side is is, uh, anxiety. The anxiety would simply come in when you're overmatched. In other words, when the task is too challenging, you become anxious that you can't do it. But on the other part of it is boredom, which is you're not challenged enough. And that's kind of the... What, what Cheek Sintmihai says is the natural state for people is either anxiety or boredom. So we either enter a state of entropy where we're kind of uh, spending too much time inside our own heads and we're worrying about things, we're, cat- we're catastrophizing, we're thinking about things too much and we're not really engaged enough. Our capacities, uh, they beg to be engaged. If you have capacities, they really beg you to engage them. They're like tools in a tool chest. They're just sitting there otherwise and they have these wonderful abilities to do things for you. But if you don't employ them, they can't help you. So for people, I I hear a lot of clients talk about really getting stuck with the overthinking and the ruminating and getting stuck in that spot. What would you recommend to somebody who wants to get into that flow space, but is really stuck in the overthinking? Yeah, the overthinking can lead to procrastination, pretty obviously. So the way to break through that is you really got to do something with your hands. You got to break out and you got to find activities that you can do that will really allow you to, to, to re-engage with your body for one thing, to be able to move your body and use your hands and move, use your head and, and put everything to work, whether it's, you know, taking a class or something, a short course, maybe in pottery, for instance, where you can be very tactile, do things with your hands and where you have to make decisions every step of the way in building something. So learning to not overthink or rather learn when to put the brakes on it and say, I've thought about this enough and I'm going to move on. Sometimes you allow yourself a period each day where you just worry about everything, maybe for 15 minutes or a half hour. So, okay, this is my period of worrying and I'm not really going to think about this the rest of the day. So it's acknowledging that you're going to worry and you're going to be someone that overthinks because that's how your trait is. If you're a sensitive person, you're, you're built, you're hardwired, your brain works in a slightly different way. You are meant to overthink in, in a sense. So, because you take in stimulation all day long and you think about it and you process it and then you make connections to other things that have happened, trying to ferret out dangers and hazards and risk and mitigate all of that before you take an action. So it really is a pause to check before you take an action. But it can also become procrastination very easily because you think about it so much that you can't break free of it. And sometimes it takes getting out of the house. It takes having a better job. A lot of times sensitive people kind of hamstring themselves by not having the right work, you know, by not having the right relationships, by not having the right life, because they've set it up in a way that really kind of caters to their worst instincts, which are to overthink and ruminate and to have anxiety rather than find a way to adapt their life to fit them and the real potentiality of the trade itself. So learning to break free free of overthinking is not really something you can do overnight. It's something you have to practice. And something you have to work at, and it helps to have other people to work with you, whether it's friends that are a little more advanced, that are a little more self-aware, especially about the trait itself, or whether it's a therapist, or whether it's people that are really not even sensitive at all, that simply are more mature and understand what where you're at and how to move you forward. So we don't always have to post-process with other HSTs. We can find uh, very good people that are less sensitive, that are just simply more worldly and understand how to how to move things along quicker or how to help you break free from overthinking. Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes on the weekends, 
my energy just is really down and I hang out in bed in the morning. I'm, I'm up very early. And of course, I'm on my phone. We've, we've all talked about that. Bless my husband's heart. He'll come in and I'll be like, I'm stuck in bed. And he just puts out his hand to get me up. Like if we're going to sit and talk about it, I'm going to talk about staying in bed for another hour. If he gives me his hand, it gets me out of bed and I get moving. So it really is that place of it's for some of us, it's very safe to be in our heads. That's where we're really comfortable and it's familiar. And sometimes we just need to figure out a gentle, loving, kind way to start taking action to just start that little bit of movement. Right, exactly. You know, and movement is good for the body and good for the mind. And it, human connection is everything. So a lot of times we're not wanting to break break out of our procrastination or out of our rut because no one has touched us. You know, nobody has reached their hand out to us. We don't feel socialized. We don't feel a part of things. And so we feel kind of lonely. We can retreat into our heads. That's a safe space for sure. But it's also a, a place where you're not necessarily experiencing everything that you might like to experience. So breaking out, breaking out of that comfort zone, and it is a comfort zone, some place you can retreat into. And that brings to mind Viktor Frankl's book, The Man's Search for Meaning. He was a concentration camp survivor in World War II. And he said the people who survived the best were the ones that had some, some inner space to retreat to. So he was really talking about introverts, people that they had this inner space they could retreat to. In other words, they weren't living externally with all the horrible things that were happening in front of them. They had this space they could retreat inside of, a safe space. That helped them to preserve themselves through what were you know, extremely trying conditions. But then being able to have a way to motivate ourselves, to be excited about life in some way. And it's it always comes in fits and starts. We all have down days and times when we do need to seclude ourselves and just re-energize. But otherwise, we need to have ways that we can engage, things that kind of cause us to get up in the morning. You know, a fundamental sense of curiosity or wonder and awe that may sound more grandiose than it is, but it's just looking forward to what each new day might bring. So having an optimism for it, a flexible sense of optimism that acknowledges pessimism. Pessimism has a place, but it has a flexible optimism that kind of a, that Positive psychologist Martin Martin Seligman actually described a positive, flexible sort of optimism. Sure. And I would say with Viktor Frankl that he was talking about the highly sensitive person, introvert or extrovert. We all go inside to look for meaning. Right. Yeah, it may be very well that he was talking about highly sensitive people. But this idea that pe these people that did the best in these concentration camps are the ones that had an inner space they could retreat to. Um, they didn't tend to suffer as much. Sure, sure. And I heard you say that HSPs are wired for creativity. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and, and Dr. Aaron has talked about this as well, that we seem to be naturally predisposed to creativity or that uh, sensory processing sensitivity is by definition a creative trait. When you think about the, the sensitivities of subtleties, for instance, they've done studies where they've determined that people that are sensitive tend to scan a visual scene more carefully than do less sensitive people. When you combine that with more elaborate processing of experience and stimulation in the mind, you, you get somebody that is you know, highly emp empathetic, someone that has a broader emotional range. So we can not only pull from kind of whatever we are, but we can pull from the opposite side of it. And that's something that Csikszentmihalyi, the originator of flow actually talks about too, is, is psychological androgyny or this idea that we can embody kind of both traits of male and female. This isn't gender androgyny. This is really, this is really psychological androgyny, that we have a broader emotional range. And so we can not only be nurturant, but we can be goal-oriented. And those things are really great for creativity. He also describes it as the one word that describes creativity the best is complexity. And highly sensitive people do tend to be complex people that are multifaceted and multipotentialites. So we, by definition, are creative, but that doesn't mean that we all engage our creativity in the same way, artistically, that is. Creativity often has been thought of as artistic end product, and that's not necessarily the case. Yes, there are those of us, probably very many of us, who are performers and artists and uh, kind of visual artists in some way or performance artists in some way, but creativity also is creative thinking. This is something I deal with because I'm a, actually a program chairman for a master's program. And one of the things I teach my students is critical creative thinking. So the idea of creative thinking being divergent thinking or thinking that is generative and productive and that looks for options and alternatives, being creative psychologically, you know, in your thought processes, your cognitive processes, that complements the rational thinking capacities. So you generate things with creative thinking, and then you're able to assess and evaluate those using rational critical thinking. The two work hand in hand, hand in glove. So being 
critical and being creative, this really should be the goal for highly sensitive people. We have to develop the critical thinking capacities because we're not born with those, but we are born kind of with an innate sort yeah, of it's instinct interesting. for creativity. I, when I started the podcast, I would ask all my guests about play. And often people would say, well, I don't really play, but I love reading or writing or researching. So what I seem to find out is that when we use our brains to engage, that's really stimulating. And that's fun where we often have a cultural view of play as being something that's outdoors and it's gregarious and playing ball or catch or frisbee or going to a concert or something where it seems like for a number of highly sensitive people that I've, I've spoken with that when we engage our brains in stimulating activities, that that feels like play, which ties into what you're talking about right now. Right. Yeah. The, the flow experience is the best play experience you could have. I mean, when you're doing away with anxiety and boredom and tension and you're fully engaged in the moment, there is no better play experience than that. And it may be work. You may be doing something that uh, is actually work, physical work in some way. I did that just last summer. In fact, when I built a mini camper, a five foot by 10 mini camper, but it, it, it was it was a lot of work and it was hot and, it, it, you know, I got a lot of cuts and scrapes, but it was one of the most fun things I've done in a very long time. And it really felt like play. So play doesn't have to be something that is innocuous or something that doesn't have meaning. It can have great meaning because if you do it in the right way, it can be a flow experience and you can grow from that experience as well as have just a great time doing it. I love that. We're running running out of time, but I wanted to just ask if you could talk a little bit about something I heard you say in your book is that when we set boundaries with other people, you were talking about kind of the kinds of boundaries that HSPs have and limiting stimulation and anticipating what to do if a boundary is crossed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, setting boundaries is one of the most, uh, one of the most significant things that highly sensitive people need to work on. Because being, uh, by definition, creative or being predisposed to creativity implies that we're also open to new experiences, which means we have a porous sort of boundary that's more easily permeated. But the problem with that is, of course, that other people can intrude on that. We need to know where we need to set a boundary. And the only way, unfortunately, that you know where a boundary is is by hitting a limit. (laughs) Once you hit that limit, you know, oh, that's a place I don't need to go again. So you learn how to set a boundary there. And you need to learn how to be aware when other people are approaching that boundary and then being effective about refuting that or allowing that person to understand that this is a boundary I'm not going to I'm not going to allow you to cross. But do so in a kind way that's generous at the same time, you know, that you're not comfortable with them crossing that boundary. And if they're a person that you want to be around, they'll respect that. And then you also talked about when we're overactivated, that you find it really helpful to pause and refrain. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, being overstimulated is is, a, is an aversive state, almost like boredom in a way, only more intense in the moment. Being able to withdraw so that you can engage your rational brain and then having a few moments, whether it's actually a few minutes or whether it's a half hour or an hour or however long, it allows the body to sort of release that tension. It's kind of like a cat. If you pet a cat really intensely, it's going to have all this energy built up that's got to jump. <laughs> you know, the cat has to jump and run to, to get out of the, get all that energy out of it. It's the same way, I think, for sensitive people. We're kind of like cats in a way. We've been pet the wrong way you know, against our fur, and all of a sudden we have this terrible energy inside that's overstimulated. We need to run off so we can, re- we can collect ourselves. So learning that we need to be self-compassionate, that that's how our trait works, that we're going to be overstimulated by some things, and being kind with that, and allowing that that's going to happen in the world because the world is a noisy, busy, rushed, um, sometimes a crude place but being compassionate with ourselves for what we're feeling because whatever we're feeling, there's nothing bad about what we're feeling. There's no shame in what we're feeling. We feel what we feel. We should just label that emotion and go on and know it's going to pass. But learning to do that is quite difficult. And so people often avoid situations that they know might provoke some overstimulation, but that can be a problem. So learning to move out of that comfort zone to a certain extent is really key and learning to self soothe so that you can withdraw and then relax your body again, give your, your mind a chance to relax and your blood pressure to come down and all of that overstimulation to kind of re- release itself. Then you can re-engage rationally with it and say, hey, that really maybe wasn't so bad. Or maybe that person didn't mean what they said or whatever happened was in the moment. You have a chance to engage it and think about it in a rational way and say, this isn't permanent. You know, it doesn't affect everything else. And it's just a temporary thing. You know, it's passing. And with that in mind, you're, you're able to move forward 
but it's not the funnest thing in the world to be overstimulated or have to deal with that. But so that's why you have to learn to be self-compassionate and to love yourself in that way, you know, to almost parent yourself in a way, thinking of yourself as your own child in a way, because that really helps to see it objectively so that you're not being harsh on yourself. You're not being overly critical of yourself and you shouldn't be critical of yourself. Your trait is a wonderful trait that has a place in the world learning to find where that place is, where you want it to be, where you want to make your contributions is really the key. I love that. And we talked about this before we started recording. What do you think of the term highly sensitive person? I understand how the term was derived because Dr. Elaine Aaron has spoken about it quite at length and has puzzled about what is a better descriptive phrase for it. And we've really not come up with anything really that better because it really has to be a sensitivity. And it's funny I've kept a journal since I was about 23 years old and I was recently rereading some of my oldest ones. And so maybe when I was 23, 24, I wrote something about one of my daughters that she was sensitive like me. This was long before I ever knew I was an HSP. So I even knew this implicitly long ago. I'm 53 now. So this is 30 years ago. I knew this already. Wow. There's not really a better phrase for it. Unfortunately, there's different ways of framing it. Like for instance, vantage sensitivity is a kind of a new theory that's one of the most widely accepted ones now that is an outgrowth of differential susceptibility. I think vantage sensitivity is kind of a better term in a way, but we can't really say that to people, you know, I'm a vantage sensitive, they won't get that. It's the idea that sensitivity applies across all stimulation, across across all things in life. Yeah, yeah. What would you want to tell your younger self about being a highly sensitive person? I thought about that one, actually. I don't know that I could tell myself anything useful because what would be of most use is always going to be the environment that you're in. If you're not in an environment that is supportive of you, that that is not positive for you, then it goes against vantage sensitivity. We know from vantage sensitivity that HSPs do far better than less sensitive people if they're in a positive, supportive environment, but they do far less, they do worse than other people if they're not in a supportive environment. So my younger self already knows that. (laughs) So unless you could change the the circumstances for the person, it really is not going to make any difference if I can tell them, hey, you're a highly sensitive person because I already kind of implicitly know that. But it really comes down to the environment again. And if I could change the environment, then that would change my younger self, but not if I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that we didn't touch on that is important to mention before we wrap up? Yeah, we didn't touch on highly sensitive men. And I think that's a really important topic that is coming out in 2020. You know, um, several of us are doing a a workshop at 1440 Multiversity. Myself, John Hughes, and Dr. Elaine Aaron is going to be at 1440 Multiversity for a highly sensitive men's weekend, March 13th through 15th. And it's the first ever men's workshop. So it's, uh, and we have, about 30 attendees right now. So it's really filled up to a nice degree. And it's going to, there's going to be more people sign up eventually too. But highly sensitive men have this additional wrinkle. And I'm actually uh, deep into writing my book on highly sensitive men at the moment. It'll be released later this summer. But highly sensitive men have the additional problem of dealing with masculinity and the way that masculinity tries to, or culture tries to impose this vision of masculinity as something that uh, doesn't really square with being a sensitive person that it asks us to act in a way that we really don't feel authentically. Uh, So learning to really embrace yourself as a sensitive person and be okay with that, learning to allow your sensitivity, you eventually can come to an acceptance of it. But sensitive men uh, are pretty much in the shadows still. You know, they really haven't stepped out because they've either had it squashed out of them by their parents growing up or by society. So learning to come to a sense of who we are and learning to come to a self-awareness about sensory processing sensitivity and its giftedness, because it's a wonderful trait to have. But learning to see that in a different way and reframe it can help you live a much more fulfilling and rewarding life and a happier life, because you're not denying a part of yourself. You're actually living that part of yourself that's a fuller realization of who you can be. So highly sensitive men are, an, are, are, are a very important part of this equation that we're talking about with highly sensitive people. For the most part, we don't tend to mention them too much. But we're starting to bring that profile up and we're envisioning uh, 2020 as the year of the highly sensitive man. And we're promoting it that way. I love that. And for the listeners, if you haven't listened to episode 60 with Tom Falkenstein, who wrote the book, The Highly Sensitive Man, we talk about 
some of the ways that sensitivity impacts men. So if you're interested in that, that's episode 60. Tracy, where can people find you? Are there any other projects that you're working on? And why don't you give a shout out to your books that you have also? Sure. Yeah. People can find me on several different social media. Ironically, (laughs) you can find me on Facebook at Tracy Cooper PhD. You can find my website at tracycooper.wordpress.com. I'm on Twitter as well. Easily found LinkedIn, even Instagram lately. I'm working on Empowering the Sensitive Male Soul, which is the Highly Sensitive Man book. And I'm following that up with a book on entrepreneurship and the Highly Sensitive Person, which is a follow-up to my first book, Thrive, the book on career. And then I have a third book in the works for next year, which is going to be completely on creativity and the Highly Sensitive Person. You've got all kinds of stuff going on. That's great. Not coincidental for a sensation-seeking HSP, right? (laughs) (laughs) That sounds great. Tracy, is there anything else before we go? I would just implore highly sensitive people to be kind to themselves and to get to know themselves over time and to allow that trait to be and not examine it too harshly or to think about it too much. Just learn to live your life in the moment and uh, accept that this is how you were born in this life, that you're the way that you are is not necessarily influenced completely by being a sensitive person. You know, some of it is genetics, some of it is your early environment. But an awful lot of it is also your personal choices. And so you have a lot of free will in your personal choices to adapt your life so that it works for you. So in that sense, really adapt your life to make it fit you as a sensitive person. Don't try to fit yourself into things that won't work. Yeah. And what we know is that highly sensitive people make up about 50% of the people that are in therapy. We have better outcomes if we've got a good therapist and a good therapeutic relationship. So if you do have wounding or things didn't work out well in your past, we fare better and there's always a way to work on some of those things. So we really can embrace and appreciate the traits that we have if, if we're struggling with our sensitivity. That's right. You know, Vantage sensitivity tells us that we respond much better than other people do to therapies. So we tend to be motivated to want to work on our issues and to improve our lives. Yeah. Tracy, thank you so much for taking the time to be with listeners today. This has been an amazing conversation. You're very welcome, Patricia. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Hey there. So I'm curious to know, what did you think about this episode? I think I'm going to have to listen to it a few times because there was just so much information and I was processing so much and copiously taking notes while we were doing the interview. I'm, I'm actually a little bit overwhelmed just looking at all of the handwritten notes that I wrote as I'm starting to write up the show notes that you will be able to see. So I'm curious, do you identify as a high sensation seeker? If you're in our Facebook group, I think what I'm going to do is try and remember to start a post and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. So you could always shoot me an email at unapologetically sensitive at gmail.com. I think about the time that this episode releases, the next round of the HSP online courses should be starting. You can go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com, go to the HSP groups page. They've really been transformational. And now that we are about maybe nine months since Jen and I ran the first beta group, and I've had contact with some of the people that have gone through the first, second, and now if you're listening in real time, we're in the third generation of groups. It's just fascinating to see the changes and growth that has happened with these folks who went through the earlier groups after they go through it and they've got time to process and to see the changes that they're making in their lives, I think it's really powerful. If you have any questions, I offer a free 20 minute consult. I'd love to work with you. I really believe as highly sensitive people, we can embrace the trait of sensitivity. We can thrive as HSPs. We are going to have stuff that we struggle with, but I really believe that we are here to make a difference in the world. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. Oh,